City fans will always remember and respect players, always put a shift in for the shirt. I'm delighted to welcome my next guest, Tales of Blue, who certainly did that. Eva Goldig. How are you doing, Eddie? I'm good, Mark. Very well, thanks. How are you? Yep, not too bad. Doing what we need to do during this crazy period to get through it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, mate. Yeah, absolutely. It's been difficult, but got to stay positive. Hopefully it's nearly over. Absolutely. Really, I'll get straight into the questions, and this is one I'm always intrigued to me, so I always ask it. Uh, who did a young Eddie McGoldrick grow up supporting, and who were your football idols? Right, yeah, well, it was funny. I got asked this the other day. I, um, I was just a great lover of football, really. I was a great lover of football from an early age. And obviously moving about, <clears throat> my dad used to take me to watch, um, when he moved from Dublin, we moved to North London, so he would go to Highbury. Um, he would go to Highbury and he'd go to Tottenham. Um, and then he had, as I got a little bit older, we moved to Corby in 1965 when I was born. And um, when, we, when I got a little bit older, he had relations in Sale, um, just off the Sale Road up in, uh, up in Manchester. And um, they were City fans, but we also had relatives that were Man United fans as well. So... When I used to, he was a truck driver, my dad, so I used to go with him in the truck when I got old enough. And um, I'd go to both, but I was a great, just a great football fan. I was a great football fan. Um, and I think probably back in those days, without being a Man United fan, George Best, because of the Irish connection with my dad, would have been a, a player that I looked, not up to, but a player that I admired and would look at and think, well, you'd want to be like him one day. But then as I got older, I grew out of that in the position that I was playing in growing up as a kid, which was a sweeper. Um, Rudy Kroll was my first real hero at that level. Um, and then obviously as I got a little bit older, I got introduced to Italian football. Franco Brazi became that, that player then. So there were probably three standout idols um, that were big parts or parts of my sort of youth football growing up without really ever being supporting anybody to grow like from the age of about 15 probably a little bit younger as well Mark I went to every cup final at Wembley between a period of like 1982 through to 1989 you know I went to every cup final I used to like to go to, I used to love going to watch football yeah, so you've got some good memories of them finals then, big days. Yeah, I mean, me and me, my mate, didn't matter who it was, and we went to Tottenham QPR, we went to uh, Man City, Tottenham, we went to, uh, oh, there was loads that we went to. Um, it was just, I was just a great lover of football, that's what it was with me. Fasting, jumping straight forward, Eddie, so you were playing Premier League football with Arsenal when City came calling, in September 1986. When did you first hear of the move to City could happen? Um, probably on the Tuesday, Tuesday or the Wednesday of that week, I'd um, I'd had a conversation with David Dean, and I was just like, I need to play football now. I'd spent a long time out of the Arsenal squad through, obviously through choice of the the manager, which me and him never really hit it off, Bruce Rioch. And, and through injury as well. So I'd had a couple of niggles as well that year. And then, you know, little things like that, used to, I was set back a couple of times. So I um, got home and I had a call from the club. And then the guy that was brokering the deal through Jerome Anderson, Anderson's agent, who was big mates with Friday Lee, um, and had done Uwe Rosler's deal to, to City. They rang me and said, would you be interested in going to City? And I'd had on the Wednesday as well, I'd had a bit of interest from Knox Forest as well, Mark. So Okay, I was going to ask, was there other options to go? Yeah, there was a couple of other options and they were, but City, City came in and, 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 and Nottingham was, was basically an hour from where I lived, so I could have went home to Corby. Um, but as soon as I knew City were interested, it was always going to be them, regardless of them being relegated. Um, I always want, I, I just said, yeah, let's do the deal. We can go up there. So initially it was a month's loan with a view to a, a permanent deal. So 
got the call, everything was sorted on the Thursday night. New on Thursday night, so I just drove to Highbury on the on the Friday morning and picked up my boots and you know a few few other bits and and then flew up flew up from Gatwick, got picked up by I think it was Jimmy Frizzell. I was thinking about that today. I think it was he was a chief scout, wasn't he? Do you remember him? He was, yeah. I'm not too sure if he was still there, ninety six, ninety seven. Possibly was it? Uh, yeah, Scottish. I'm sure it was Jimmy Frizzell that picked me. I, I might be wrong, but it was a it was a node it was a node type. Um, chap that had been in the game for a long time with a lot of good background, and I knew. Uh, and he took me to the he took me to Main Road, and I met Roy Bailey. Done the medical, and that was done. And then I got dropped off at uh, the uh, the hotel out in um, what's it called, Ardley Edge? Is it Ardley Edge, big hotel there. And Nigel Clough was staying there, so. Um, or he wasn't, or he picked me up there the next day anyway. So I stayed there overnight and um, Nigel picked me up from there Saturday lunchtime and then took me into Main Road. We had Birmingham at home on the on the Saturday. Yeah. So it was initially um, a loan deal. Uh, Asa Hartford was the manager, caretaker manager at the time, signed you, Eddie. What, yeah. did City, what, what were they looking for you? What was what was asked of you coming in initially as a, as a loan player? <coughs> well, I'm not too. I'm not too sure. Obviously, maybe to to bring some experience, because um, I certainly had that. You know, I was probably the right age, thirty, thirty-one, um, and I can't remember whether I'd said to the agent that I wanted to play at the back, because um, I'd been playing there in the reserves at Arsenal in that period of of not playing and wanting to get away and find a new club. So. Um, Spoke to Asa briefly on the phone on the on the Friday night, and he said, "Do you want to play at the back?" And I said, "Yeah." I said, "If you if you want to play in that sort of system with three, um, are you you know are you comfortable doing that?" And he said, "Well, absolutely, because we're struggling at the moment. City were third bottom at the time uh, of the championship, and he said we just need to grind out a result and keep it tight at the back. So that's you know was perfect for me. I just slotted in there straight away behind." Kit Simons and uh, Bob Brightwell, I think, on the Saturday against Birmingham. And, uh, yeah, we just went from there. And then to Paul Dickoff, who you'd known from your Arsenal days, who joined City, not before you. Um, was there any other players you were familiar with in the squad at that stage? Well, Alan Kernigan was a teammate. <clears throat> I played with, I, with, that, with Alan at um, the Republic of Ireland. Um, so I knew, I knew Alan, but you know the players. You know the players. I've obviously seen a lot of the players on the on the television um, the year before. I knew Paul Beasley, um, but Bees came in a little bit after that, after me at that point. But yeah, you, you just get to know the players. Obviously, you know City had been on the television quite a lot that year as well. So um, yeah, it was just one of those that you kind of just go in and introduce yourself and you know get on with it and hope for, hopefully everything would be okay. But I'd spoke to Paul on the Friday as well. Um, to say that I was signing on a month's loan, so yeah, he was pleased. It was good to see him. It was always nice to have somebody there, you know, to bounce off straight away. That makes you feel a little bit more comfortable and yeah. safe when you go into the change room. Because literally, it was like you know, f- flew up on the Friday, got picked up, had the medical, went to the hotel, and then walked into the dressing room at Main Road literally an hour before kickoff. So didn't really have a you know, a lot of time to get to know anybody, just had to hit the ground running, really, and it was a big game. Well, do I mean, on, on paper, Eddie, that season, City had a good squad, decent squad, and we were expecting the sort of challenge for immediate return to the Premier League. What were your, can you remember your first impressions going in? What was it like, the atmosphere among sort of the, the squad? And <clears throat> I think initially, um, when I sort of look back and I think about it, they were getting a lot of bad press. There was a lot of there was a lot of bad press going on, and the fans weren't happy with the, with the board and Franny, and the players weren't performing. So maybe there was a slight hangover from getting relegated from the Premiership. So at that point, then they lost all their what you'd say their top players: Keith Curl, Niall Quinn. Um, I think there was a few others went as well, weren't there? I don't know. Remember if it was, was Terry feeling there at the time? Did Terry go as well at that point? He'd gone earlier, yeah, earlier in the previous. <clears throat> well, we kind of lost three or four of their really well-established players, and um, that were their go-to players in the Premier League. So 
there was a little bit of a there was a little bit of a stigma about the place in terms of you know they hadn't got off to a great start in the championship and um, the crowd the, you know, an amazing support as well and that's why I went there really because I always loved playing at Main Road so I used to always love going there as a as an opposing player and you know they were always well appreciative of people playing well and good sides and people mm-hmm. that work hard so um, but yeah I think it was just really the atmosphere around the place of having got off to a great start in the championship and they'd come down and you know the board and Franny weren't investing any real big money to bring people in and get them you know back on the road to getting back into the premiership so that was my f- that was my first impression um, of going in there and that was basically purely just from reading the papers and, you know, what was being said on the television, Mark. So, but, you know, I had to go in and do a job and I was excited and nervous at the same time. So running down that tunnel at Main Road and out on the, out on the hallowed turf, um, there was, um, yeah, it was a great feeling when we, when I did get to do that on that Saturday. It was 20, 21st of September, 96, Seizure City debut and a 1-0 win over Birmingham at Main Road. What did you call about? your performance that day and do you remember who scored the only goal of the game? Yeah, I do remember it very well. Um, big crowd, again, 30 plus thousand, um, really good atmosphere and I played well. I played well. I know I did. I played well. I think I was actually given man of the match but going in in that sweeper role, I just gave, you know, I, I was in that position, I was a great communicator with people. You know, I'd organise people and we played with wing backs and I think um, Buzzer was on the right and I can't remember who played left side that day. But obviously there was I think there was Bob and um, Logger, which is Bob Brightwell, uh, Kit Simons. And I just swept up and I used to, when I got opportunities to step out and, and play, I would step into midfield and link the play and you know, hit a couple of decent half, you know, cross field passes and um, yeah, it was. It was, but it was a tense game. It was. It was tight right up until about the 80th minute, and then I'm not sure whether it was me that supplied the pass for Dicky over the top, went through, won the penalty, and Kinky. Uh, I always remember turning around because I couldn't watch. I couldn't watch. I was just like, please, let us get off to a winning start in my first game. So, yeah, and Kinky finished it, and then um, yeah, we went went to obviously hold on and win the game one 0 So yeah, brilliant. Steve Couple comes in, but this. Um made you a full-time blue after just five games. <laughs> was it always the intention to sign permanently, Eddie, when you initially joined on loan? Was that well, it's funny. If we, go, if we just go back to that game, Mark. And it's funny because I've got a letter here. I kept this letter. I was sent a letter by a, a chap called Mr. Robert Ball, right? So the first week I was there, and he, he's from Haslington in Crewe and a big City fan. And he wrote to me saying, I'm writing to show my appreciation of your performance on Saturday against Birmingham City. To put things into perspective, I've never written to a player before, so you can judge from that, that the impact that you made. And he just goes on to say, I'm sure you will read now the complimentary reports in the papers, but you, won, you wouldn't have heard the fans talking as they left the ground. Everybody, including himself, was full of Eddie McGoldrick. We've got to sign him. So that was nice. And I've kept that to this day. But I've walked in, when we walked in and we were, you know, we were obviously full of elation, and it was a lot of a lot of pressure off because obviously we were, we were in the in the relegation zone at that point. And I was in the shower, and Franny came in, and he said, um, "Well played." He said, "Absolutely perfect, just what we're looking for." He said, "Doesn't matter." He said, "You've got five games left in your loan." He said, "I don't care how you play." He said, um, "We'll do a deal at the end of it." So if you want to stay here, um, we'd love to have you. So. I just said, yeah. look, that's great. So that was that was brilliant. So I knew even before he said that I wanted to stay, I wanted to make it, you know, a permanent home and a permanent move. So I was just pleased that it worked out like that. So when Steve came in, um, obviously that connection that I'd had with him from Palace, he'd signed me from Northampton to go to Crystal Palace all those years ago in 1989. So um, it was good. Disappointed the way that ended. Yeah, disappointing the way that ended. Um, but I think regardless of who came in, I would have signed anyway because, what, you know... What was, what was the lad's name who wrote the letter, Eddie? Just in case he, he might say this. Yeah, it's a chap called Mr Robert Ball. And he's from Haslington and Crew. Well, hopefully he'll see this when it goes out and, and 
get in yeah, touch. Yes, so with. I mean, it's lovely, and I've kept it to this day because I thought it was really nice. Um, it was really nice. So, um, so he says, cheers for playing the blinder and giving us blue fans at a time when we really needed it and hoping that City have already put contract in front of you. So please sign it. So it's always nice to get those. Absolutely. Those there wouldn't have been too many letters. players who've got. There wouldn't have been too many players got letters in any couple of sessions. <laughs> that's fair. Well, that's fair. Well, they got letters, but not ones they wanted to keep. Um, yeah. But it was obviously a lift at that point that gave, you know, the supporters a bit of hope. And, you know, it wasn't a, you know, a massive sign. And they didn't come in for big money. But I was a player that had been around the Premiership for a long time, had won promotions, had played for my country. So, um, yeah, it was obviously a little bit of experience that I could add and, and come in. And, yeah. It was, it was just, for me, it was just a great move. As you said, Steve Koppel came in and then just a few weeks later was gone again. 32 days in total in charge, leaving on health grounds. Have the players had any indication that he was about to leave or what are your thoughts on that situation looking back now? Yeah, it was, it was weird. It was, because I think that month, that month that he came in, we had something like about three or four away games down in the south of England. I think we had South End away, we had QPR away, we had Reading away. Um, so we were up and down the motorway and he was up and down. And then when we, when we travelled back after a game, he wouldn't travel back with us. So we'd obviously have his day off in London and stay down there and then come back up on the Friday. Um, so I don't know whether his family life at that point was maybe not what it should be. And there was maybe a little bit of unsettlement there. And, um, there's a lot being said about the situation that it was down to health reasons, and but I, I'm not I'm not quite so sure about that, Mark. To be perfectly honest, I, I'd like to think that I knew Steve. Steve's a very personable man. He's very quiet. He keeps he keeps his private life to himself, and you know maybe at that point, you know his his home life wasn't maybe because of that move, and he was away from home, and I knew he just had a, a, a small you know, another baby, a small child, and the baby was only young. So maybe that was had an influence on his situation at the time. So, but, you know, overall it was a, you know, it was a massive disappointment because, you know, he was a good manager, you know, he knew that league, he knew how to get teams promoted. And it was just a real shame the way it, you know, the way it worked out. And, and the reason I say that is because, and the reason I have doubts about it being what it was, is that, Six months later, he becomes the manager of Crystal Palace yeah. and takes them to the playoff final. So, you know, there's a lot being said about it over the years. But from our point of view and from our perspective, it was a big disappointment to lose him at that time. Yeah. So Phil Neal becomes caretaker manager and quickly followed into the hot seat by Frank Clark, picking you to four managers in just your first five months at the club. When did you start <laughs> to wonder, Eddie, what the hell you'd let yourself in for? <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. Well, it was funny because I think I'd said in a press interview that I'd done after that Birmingham game, um, they were like, welcome to the crisis that is called Manchester City. And I was like, what crisis? But as things began to unfold, um, sort of like over the coming weeks and months, it certainly was a bit of a rocky horror show at that point. And, you know, but listen, as players... We've just got to get on with it. You know, we're paid to play football. We're paid to train and train hard and train well and play well, hopefully. And that's all we try to do. We try to bring the best. The next question I was going to say, what kind of in, impact of all the changes does that have on the squad or the player individually for the spirit in the camp, the, you know, whether all these coming and goings, how does that affect the squad or a player? It was, it was, it was difficult at the time, Mark, because obviously... And, and I think Asa, Asa and Tony Burke, have, you know, have done a really good job as well. You know, and two highly thought of, respected. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, you know, especially the skit, you know, what a legend. And Asa, what a player he'd been for, you know, for City as well. So they were highly respected men, not just coaches. You know, and well they did at the football club. And they'd done a, you know, they'd obviously done a, you know, decent enough job, but Obviously, the, the board felt that they needed a name and they thought Steve was that. So, and I think it was just a case of a merry-go-round of actually just trying to get the right man that was going to fit the personality of the club at that point. 
somebody that was well skilled and they could maybe steady the ship and you know had a bit of experience in getting players in whether it was on loan or getting them in you know on deals um, so and I thought at that point Frank Clark was a really good fit and he brought in you know a backroom staff of Alan Hill who I knew, knew from my forest days as well you know playing them and and Richard Money and he was Richard was Richard's probably got to be one of the best coaches I've ever worked under in terms of actually coaching footballers and his understanding of the game and what he can bring. So I think when Frank came in, we felt it was the right choice. And we, you know, we could just get a couple of results back to back and go on a run. You know, we might just surprise a few people and, you know, see where it took us. Yeah. We never seemed to get that next result we needed to really get a run going. Always assumed well, we've got that result and the, the next one never really followed it on. I remember looking back. Yeah, it was... So we had some really good performances that season, you know, away at Bradford away, you know, and I don't mean like people City fans probably would be like, all right, Bradford away, but it was a good performance. We had a good team. It was a good side. It was just beginning to gel, you know, we had Uwe and Paul up front, and we were solid. Frank had moved me into a more forward position, sitting in front of the back four. We had Buzzer on the right, Beegs, we had Kinky, you know, and what a player he was to play with. You know, Uwe and, and, and Paul up front and Bob and, and Kit Simons and Beeks. You know, we had a side. Paul Beasley, solid, had been around the Premiership. Yeah. Solid centre-half. Alan Kernigan. You know, we had some players in there. Michael Brown, Steve Lomas. You know, we had, we had some off players. Them, when you read off their names, Eddie, the mix was there, wasn't it? The, the, you think it was. Experienced players that you throw the Michael Browns, who was quite young at the time, and... Uh, but as for, well, Kim Tadzi is a player who can often divide opinion among the City fans. Did you find him as a player and also as a teammate? Oh, well, I love Kinky. I mean, obviously played against him the previous season um, and see sort of seasons before when I was at Palace and Arsenal, and he was just a he was just a pure talent, wasn't he? He was just, he was unbelievable with the ball at his feet. But I quickly found quickly found out that. You know, going to Reading or South End on a cold Tuesday night in that league was never going to be Kinky's bag. You know, and the boys had said to me, look, you know, you're going to have to get used to it. And that was probably the most frustrating thing about him. You know, in front of Main Road and 35, 40,000 people there, you know, with people, you know, singing his name for 20 minutes. He wanted the ball all the time. So it was very difficult to get that happy balance with him. But for me, He's got to be one of the most outstanding players that I've ever played with. He was phenomenal, a phenomenal player, certainly at home. The expectation on him must have been huge because it was just, you know, in games we were struggling from the fans' point of view, it was, we'll give it to oh. him. Yeah. And so the yeah. pressure on him must have been uh, immense. From uh, It was, it was. And I think there was a bit of a fallout from that as well. From the year before, everybody thought he was going to be that saviour. You know, he scored some terrific goals the year that City went down, that we'd gone down the year before. And, they thought he might just keep them up. And then they're like, the expectation on him then is yeah. like, he's the one that's going to get us back up. And it never really, it was never going to work out like that in the championship market. It's a tough league yeah. before we see games. And, you know, you've got to scrap your way out of games. You've got, you know, I think we went to Grimsby. We've got a place like Grimsby in South End. They were in the championship at the time. So it was tough. You know, it was a tough, tough league. Um, and it just, you know, it was, but for me, you know, and what a guy. What a guy, I loved him. Maybe a Robbie, 20, 20 years too early. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we could all say that, couldn't we? But certainly, yeah, I mean, it's just a shame that, you know, when he did leave the club that, I think he went to Ajax, didn't he? Yes, yeah. He yeah. To, and then he came back and went, went to, to Derby. Derby on, initially on loan, then, then joined. And had another go, and it was just a shame. But he used to come round to my house, him and Buzzer used to come round, and, and we'd sit and have a cup of tea in the garden, like, and, you know, we talk football, we just talk football and be like, Kinky, you know, me and Buzzer would be like, you've got to do more without the ball. No, 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 no. I used to go, no, 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 no. Eddie, you, Nicky, you just give me the ball and I will do it. So we were like, yeah, okay, but no, we mean without the ball. No, 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 no. He knew what you meant. He knew what you meant. Then. He knew what we meant, all right, to be sure, but... I mean, what a guy, what a guy and, and what a player. People say to me about some of the players that I've played with over my career. And I was very fortunate to play, you know, with some, you know, fantastic players, world-class players, you know, Ian Wright, Paul McGrath, Dennis Bergkamp, 
was lucky enough to get a sniff of you know how Vieira played and you know played with him a couple of times and you know some Roy Keane with the Republic of Ireland um, and Kinky's up there you know Kinky would be up there um, for me when people say to me who's the best players that you ever played with so I just said it the other day I was on the golf course and somebody said and and, and they went oh yeah I forgot about him I actually forgot about him and I was like how can you forget about him he's just like but it's just one of those, isn't it? It's just sometimes it's it's out, out of sight, out of mind. But yeah, what a baller. What an absolute baller. The City fans, Eddie, as we touched on earlier, when, and your, the letter proves, they seem to take to you very quickly when you joined. Um, how did you find the atmosphere playing at City? And It was proving to be a difficult spell for the club, but how was the atmosphere as a player, point of view? Do you know what struck me about Man City? Because it's funny when when you're an opposing player, or when when City would always come to us, whenever I was playing, <clears throat> you'd see the away crowd and you'd think, "Oh yeah, that's decent." But it's not until you actually play for City that you actually really appreciate it. You know, and, and that year, like I say, we were going to South End and there was Reading, and you know, in midweek, and there was like three, four thousand supporters following us. You know, for a midweek game at, you know, places that you wouldn't really want to go to on a midweek, never mind the weekend. Um, they were just phenomenal. So they were so passionate. They were so loyal. Um, and I just loved, I loved, like I said, I'd always loved playing at Main Road as an opposing player. Always loved the atmosphere. And I think they're very appreciative supporters. As long as you give your all for that shirt, um, you know, they'll always back you. And I just found that and that was, you know, I just, that's all I wanted to do. I wanted to give them something back. I appreciated the fact that I've been given a, an opportunity and to play for, for me, it's back then, it was still one of the big six clubs in the country, regardless of, you know, has been relegated the year before. So to have that honour, to pull on that shirt, them shirts that are there behind you, you know, was, was massive for me and I was determined to do everything that I could um, to to help us climb the league and get back to you know where the supporters wanted us to be. So great supporters, great place to play football. Always had been, and um, yeah, just I just loved it. The atmosphere was always brilliant, especially at Main Road. Main Road, the atmosphere when it was full, the kip acts. Yeah, it was just yeah, a fantastic place. It was a real buzz to play football there. Well, you pulled on them shirts thirty three times during that first season at the club. Which games stand out for you, Eddie? We to flip back in memory wise um, obviously my debut um, and lots of oh, with some with some good games Stoke I was Stoke at home when um, Daley and Atkinson came in Frank brought Daley and Atkinson in and he got and he struggled to settle and he was getting a little bit of stick and then he got two that day um, set a couple of goals up for him but I just love playing that midfield role you know Watford at home um, a real game that stands out for me and we were just I just at that time we were just beginning to get a bit of momentum in the league mark like you said it was we'd win a couple of games and then maybe lose and draw and then we'd win another couple of games and we could just never find that consistency but we knew we were going in the right direction we were starting to climb the league you know we were getting above mid-table and the playoffs were all of a sudden were in our, were in our vision um, and then we went on a good cup run and Middlesbrough at home in the, was it the fifth round or the sixth round of the cup at Main Road? Yeah. Um, and we were hard done by that day. We played really, really well. The decisions didn't go for us. Um, we had some good chances. I think that day we might have had at least, you know, one, one really big penalty shout. Um, and it just didn't go away. And Janino went through. I think in the 88th minute, didn't he? And snuck one under the cat, I think. And um, yeah, but that was a real, that was a good standout game. And we were, even if we thought, even if we take them back to the Riverside, we, we were confident that we could go up there and, and, and beat them. And I think that day, we just proved with the squad that we just seemed to be coming together. And, you know, while the results weren't win, 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 it might be a win, win, draw, lose, win, you know, we just needed to get that consistency. And I think once we dropped out of that, um, that cup, and they went on to the cup final that year, Middlesbrough, didn't they? 
Yes, yeah. So, yes. You, know, you know, we've got that look of the draw, that rub of the green in the draw. Who knows? It could have been us. You know, and that might have just kick-started us um, again. But, yeah, that was a real standout game. But there was lots of great games. There was lots of great games. I've got loads of them here, to be fair. <laughs> I dug out some old. I dug out, I dug out some old. Do you, know, do you know that year? I'm just looking at who's this here. Um, yeah, Swindon at home was a good performance. And when you say that now, those these teams that you go through, they're all championship teams, but they're all League 2 and League 1 now teams. Sheffield United at home. Um, but Stoke City, again, yeah. So there were some good games. Ipswich away, Norwich away. We put in good performance. I remember going down there. We went down for three or four days. We had Ipswich on Tuesday and um, Norwich on the Friday. Um, so... Yeah, it was just a shame. We just lost a little bit, a little bit of momentum towards the end of that season, and we just what did we finish about eighth that year? Yeah, it, it just faded out towards the end, didn't it? Because, with, like you said earlier, the playoffs it seemed we thought, yeah, we could be pushing. But going into the ninety-seven, ninety-eight camp, campaign, as with the previous one, promotion was expected to you know really to kick on from that ninety-six, ninety-seven season. It just didn't happen. As we, we know. But you'd only appear 11 times, Eddie, that season. The last being in November at Stockport. Which they were transfer listed by Frank Clark. Such a good first season. Where did it start to change for you that season? Well, it was funny because that season had one, I think I won three or four supporters play of the year awards. Yeah. Um, I finished second in the main, the main one. And I think, like Frank Clark always pulled, he pulled me that night when we went to the main awards. And they, if you remember right, they, at the last, I can't remember who we played the last home game of the season. It was, like, it was home. It was the very final game. And the Kip Action unveiled a big banner running the length of it in Georgian because there was a big talk of Kinky leaving. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember that. So, and Frank said to me, he said, I came second in that main one. And he said, you should have won that. He said, you've been our best player this season. So he said, but I think they've just, it was a sympathy vote to try and keep Kinky there. So um, anyway, so I finished second that. I won three or four supporters. So I was, I was in good shape. I'd looked after myself. Obviously, you know, coming from where I'd been, I'd not played for quite a long time, you know, four to six months. So I got myself back in shape. Confidence was good. Um, had a good summer. Came back, had a good start to the pre-season, and trained hard in, in what we were doing. And I was always I was always naturally fit, Mark. I was always a runner, even at sort of like 32, 33 then I could run. And um, when we put on when the when the club did put on running sessions, I was always at the front. You know, I was always up there even as, as I got older. So it was a complete surprise to me to have that season, you know, and how it developed and how it unfolded. We played Blackpool away in our first pre-season game. And I always remember going into a tackle with Gary Brabham. And I just felt some discomfort right in the lower right-hand side of my back. So Roy had come on and he said, how does it feel? So I had a little job and I said, oh, it feels all right. And then a couple of minutes later, I stretched for a ball. And it was like I pulled my hamstring. I had a hamstring injury, a hamstring strain. So carried on for another 10 minutes. Eventually he came off because I'm thinking this is... It's like gone into my hamstring. So, done some tests over the next couple of days. Nothing came back in terms of my back. It, we put it down to like a, a slight hamstring strain. So, just came back, tried to get on, and it just started to hamper me from then. I had a I had a problem that, you know, I'd be in for two games and out for two, back in for one, and you know that discomfort would come again and. You know, I just it just became a big problem for me that season, and I don't know. You know, it obviously started with that tackle in the Blackpool game yeah. with that with that player, and and it just snowballed from there really. So it was it, it was disappointing, and because I felt I still had a lot to offer, and had a good season the year before, and it was just one of those that just smacked me right in the face, and I just had to deal with it, and and I always remember I just. just I was beginning to feel good again and I was training well and I was having no discomfort and no reaction from coming back and we played down at Charlton um, 
on the Saturday and then I came back and I was going into training on the Monday and I always remember I was getting my little boy ready for school and he came, I was putting his shoes on and he stepped away and then come towards me like we were going to clash heads. So I just sort of made a sharp movement backwards and my, my back actually locked out. So I was stuck there on the couch. Um, by the time I got into training, which was probably, I was about an hour late, I just walked into Roy Bailey's room and I was like, I couldn't walk. And he was like, you know, what's happened? Um, and I actually had a, a prolapsed disc. It had gone like, you know, it was that bad. So they went in and operated and then it was just, just again, it was just one of those that I had to go through that rehab process, came back again and tried to get back in the, in the side, got in, was out, got in, was back out. And it was just, just one of those frustrating years. I wasn't... It just shows you how quickly it can change anything. Yeah. It? Such a good first season and, and yeah. so quickly. And the day I knew I was in trouble, and there's no disrespect because Nigel Clough was a fantastic footballer, um, but Cloughy couldn't run, you know, he couldn't run. And, you know, we were doing a running session around the training ground and he actually ran past me. And that's when at that point I knew, and I always remember we got round to the far corner and um, the gate was open and I just slowed down to as, as nearly walking pace and I just walked out. And I always remember Racer Hartford shouting, Eddie, you okay, what's up? And I just said, I've got to go and see Roy Ace and my back's like, I, mean, I knew at that point when, when Cloughy ran past me in a running session that I had a, a bigger problem um, than, you know, what I actually thought initially. So, um, yeah, it was, dis it was disappointing. Yeah, it was really disappointing. How, how does Eddie McGoldrick look back on his time at City now? Um, with great pride, um, with great honour. It was a real honour um, to play for Manchester City. And, you know, when you put it alongside Crystal Palace and Arsenal and Manchester City, you know, um, I'm, very, I'm very fortunate. Um, I love my time there. I love the supporters. My biggest regret is that it wasn't longer. And I think, but, you know, I'm, I'm fully aware that things happen, injuries happen, and then that changes the mindset of a manager. And, um, you know, and when you're injured, it's, it's, a, it's a dark, lonely road sometimes, Mark. It's, it's, it's depressing. It, it, you struggle with, with your mental health side a bit to get back. And um, there were some dark days, you know, coming back from that. And I hadn't had many major injuries in my career. So, and, you know, I always thought I would play till I was 37, 38. That's how fit I felt my body was. Yeah. And then bang, one tackle. And the diagnosis basically was then, because it kept flaring up, they went in and done some keyhole surgery. And you have facet joints either side of your discs, Mark, that are basically your shock absorbers, like your brake pads um, when you're driving your car. So they take all the, the weight and, you know, that supports the discs and basically one had just worn down on my right side and so that's why I just kept getting it felt like I was getting hamstring strains and that's why the disc kept popping out on that side because it, it had become on level so they'd worn down so that was a massive impact on you know my balance and you know actually getting around the pitch and you know if anybody's ever if you've ever if you've ever had a bad back you know just a little tweak you know it can really debilitate you. So, yeah, it was, but look, I look back and um, like I say, with great honour, with great pride in wearing that shirt behind you, it was, you know, something very special. And um, yeah, just wish it could have been longer, but days and a part of my career that I'll, you know, will always treasure and I'll never forget. A quick fire questions, Eddie. Uh... Favourite City game? What, that I played in? Yeah. Uh, oh, God. Obviously, I'd have to say my debut. I'd have to say my debut, followed closely by uh, the Middlesbrough at home. I think, you know, we were superb that day. Stoke again. You know, there's some really good standout performances um, and good games that year where we played really well. And I thought, yeah, if we put a really good run together here, we could get in the playoffs. But unfortunately, it wasn't to be. Favourite teammate? 
Favourite teammate um, would have to be Paul Dickoff. Obviously, from my time at Arsenal, Paul was only a young lad. Didn't really get much of a, much of a go at Arsenal, to be fair. But yeah, great lad. We used to travel in together as well. Um, and um, yeah, I still love him to this day. Worst dressed player at City when you were there? Poor. There were some bad ones, to be fair. <laughs> um, cool. uh, I'd have to say Paul Beasley. Sorry, Bees. <laughs> Who was always late for training? Um, buzzer. Oh. Always late for training. <laughs> favourite ground for you to play at? Not just with City. What was your favourite ground you played at? Or enjoyed playing at? Um, Again, as, a young, as, a, as an opposing player, I used to always love going to Main Road. The big games, Old Trafford, Anfield, Highbury. Stamford Bridge, White Hart Lane, yeah, terrific, terrific grounds to go and play with the atmospheres were always really good. Humorous moment from your time at City, would be a match day, an away day, on a coach, something funny that stands out. Oh, wow. Um, there's probably, I probably couldn't say them on camera to be fair. <laughs> 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 we, listen, we had some good times. We had, um, we had a few good nights out, especially in that orange tree in Altrincham, to be perfectly honest. But um, no more. <laughs> say no more. But yeah, listen, it was a great set of lads. We, they, they really were. They were a great set of lads. And we, we socialised together. And Frank, Frank Clark was really good, to be fair. He'd always put on days. We had quite a few days where he invited the, you know, your, whole, your, your, your partners and your wives to, to Main Road. And he used to get his guitar out and he'd let you have a beer and sing songs. So, um, yeah. I can't imagine that now. Can you, the manager, getting his guitar out? <laughs> getting his guitar out and letting you having a few beers. It's crazy, isn't it? It's so crazy, it's but... Sky Blue Umbra or Laser Kappa? Oh, Sky Blue, brother. Definitely. All day long. Okay, All day long. I've got that in the frame in the garage. That, that the one in there? That's the one in the garage, yeah. And I'm going to try and get you that. I'm going to try and get you some. You know the thing about it is... Um, I've tried to get them back because I know the sister of the, the guy that I gave them to. Right. So I asked her, I said, look, can you ask Chris if, if, if I can have my shirts back? And she was like, oh, no, you can't have them back. You gave them to him as a kid, like, and he loves them. <laughs> and she sent me some pictures of him, like, like, wearing them when he was a kid like this. And I was like, so I've got to try and get in touch with them and try and get you a couple, mate. <laughs> Fantastic. And what's the strangest thing you've ever been asked to do by a fan from any club you've played at? Uh, sign their backside. Which was that? Was that? Could have been a little bit higher up, couldn't it? To be fair, <laughs> <laughs> oh. and it wasn't. It was a lady, right. <laughs> not a man. We'll leave that one there. So obviously, I would have refused. What's your opinion, Eddie, of the Manchester City modern day City twenty twenty? Unbelievable. Yeah, unbelievable. Um, it's just, it's a different planet. They're on a different planet. Obviously, there's been a bit of a blip this year and, you know, Liverpool will go on to win the league when they do restart, but um, I'm hoping that will give Pep and the players and hopefully he can get some people in and, and another few signings to bolster, the, to bolster the squad and they can go again. But yeah, it's a different, it's a different world now and it football completely and, you know, you have to say, um, that uh, it's just for the supporters. I'm so pleased with the supporters, um, the way it's worked out because you know they went through some really tough years and they were still there and they, you know, they still went home and away. So it's great to see that that success that they've had now. And it's always nice to come up. I've been up a couple of times. It's always nice to get invited back by the club. I think they're very good like that with ex players. And um, you know, they're very down to earth. It doesn't matter how much, you know, money they've got in or, you know, or, or what they're investing in and what they're paying players and fees that they're paying for players. They, they really appreciate, you know, their ex-players and they appre appreciate their supporters. So it's great to see where they are now. Um, and it, I'll tell you this now, that um, when lockdown started and they were showing all the reruns, and it came to the last day when City won the league and Aguero scored the goal. I've got it on uh, my planner and I must have watched it seriously 
probably a hundred times and it gives me goosebumps and I actually well up I was in a pub in a restaurant outside Corby when City won that game and there was a load of Man United fans outside on the deck in watching the game out there they had the Man United game on I was inside with my friends and my partner watching the City game and when the whistle went at Sunderland they were all in the, they were all in the window you can imagine the stick that they were giving me and then um, when Aguero scored that goal, wow, well, the, play, the roof just came off the place. So I, to this day, still gives me goosebumps watching that. And I, I wasn't even involved. So that's how much that's how much City is and, you know, still means to me in my heart. So, yeah, brilliant days. Fantastic. So pa- pandemic aside, Eddie, what's, what are you up to these days? Eddie Magolzik of 2020 doing? Well, he's been off for... Uh, since March the 18th, um, I run a Crystal Palace Foundation Academy um, in Northampton, at Northampton College, which you've been to. Um, it's a football education. Yeah, brilliant setup, Mark. It's a football education programme that's designed to give aspiring young footballers and bridging the gap between college football and main academy football. So they get to train and play like a full-time pro would and they also get an education alongside it in a BTEC in sport. So the pathways that can be created from that. Um, we play in the National Football Youth League and actually City came into the league last year. So, but we, I was in a different league, so we never got to, I would, I would love to have gone back there and been in the same league and gone back up to the Etihad or gone to the Etihad to play them. So, but it gives young aspiring footballers the opportunity to, to make the way in the game. Hopefully, at league level, I think I think through the programs and the ten years that the league's been running, the programs have been running. There's over fifty players have gone into league football. Britta Sombalonga would be the main player that's come out and gone on to big things. Um, but also alongside that, Mark, it gives them an education, and it gives them an education in a B Tech in sport. And if you look at the world of sport now and the money that's in the industry, you know. Kids can go on to university and do sports law, hospitality, marketing, strength and conditioning, coaching, physiotherapy, or even if they want to go to a different country, we can help and attain them in a system with uh, getting scholarships in America. So that's what I'm doing now. I've been doing it for the last eight years now. I love my job. Um, A lot of people have asked me why I don't go back into mainstream football, um, coaching, management, but um, I don't need to do that now to boost my ego to say what well, I'm coaching for Northampton Towns or Crystal Palaces under 18s or Man City. So I love what I do. Um, it's hard enough. It's hard enough. It's long. I'm at my door at six o'clock in the morning and I'm not home till five, six o'clock at night. If we play a game on a Wednesday like we did last year away to Sunderland, I left the college at eight o'clock in the morning and never got home till 10 o'clock at night. So it can be long days, can be long hours, but I wouldn't change it for the world. And the weekends are mine. I get to spend, spend lots of time with my family and, and my granddad now and, and play lots of golf. So um, it's, it's perfect. That's what I'm doing. So I love it. Absolutely fantastic. Eddie, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you and listen to your memories, mate. Thanks for your time. I really appreciate it. Cheers, Mark. Anytime. <laughs>